Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, to keep us on schedule, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we may have some more folks walking in here, which is just fine. We'll keep the doors on the sides open for them. Uh, good morning. Welcome to the Living in the Avon Hills Conference. We're excited to have you all here today. Uh, I know it was probably a pretty tough choice when you woke up this morning and the outside temps were just cozy, warm, and beautiful for mid-February here. So thanks for choosing to spend the day with us. My name's Kyle Rao. I work here at St. John's Outdoor University. Uh, we are happy to bring you this conference along with the Avon Hills Initiative. Um, I just want to take a couple moments just to thank all of our sponsors who really make this conference possible and, and keep the price down for you all. So uh, first off, Latner Energy and Avon, as well as St. Cloud Subaru, and uh, they've continued to support this conference year to year um, and really is a, a symbol of their dedication to outdoor education and environmental education. So big thanks to those sponsors. Um, secondly, I'd also like to thank uh, the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, as suggested by the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources. This LCCMR grant is really what makes this conference possible for us. Uh, it has also helped to protect, or is protecting, um, over a thousand acres in the lovely Avon Hills. And these, these are high quality uh, natural lands that LCCMR monies are, are helping to protect along with this educational outreach um, with the conference. Uh, so many thanks to our sponsors. We appreciate all that support. Uh, for you, those of you coming in, find yourselves a seat. We're, we're just getting started, so make yourselves comfortable. Um, as you looked at the conference today, uh, looked at the brochure, I'm sure that's what brought a lot of you out here. So just a big shout out to all of our speakers. Um, all of our exhibitors over in the exhibit hall, all of our volunteers who are helping to make this possible. Um, and, and again, thank, to all, thank you to all of you for coming out today. Um, it looks like we're going to have uh, over 200 people in attendance today, so um, we've got a great event. Um, <clears throat> as we look at uh, a few logistics, um, if you're just coming in, if you haven't already, um, please do check in. So over in the great hall, which is next door, to us, um, you'll find the registration table. So uh, if you have not yet checked in, please do uh, do that. You can wait until after the keynote um, to check in. Um, when you check in, you'll get yourself a folder. So in those folders, if you haven't looked yet, you'll find the schedule for the day. Uh, you'll also find a yellow evaluation form. So we ask as, as the day goes on here, just take a couple minutes to jot down your thoughts and, and give us some uh, some feedback on our presentations and the layout of the schedule and so forth. Um, there will be a box at registration, so when you leave today, just drop the evaluation form off there. Um, you also see our upcoming events, so Outdoor U has a number of environmental ed and outdoor education programs throughout the spring months here. Um, one to highlight is our Minnesota Master Naturalist course in late May, so keep an eye on that. Um, we're also happy to be hosting our, our central chapter of the Master Naturalist program here so you can go and talk with them. They'll be in the exhibit hall uh, to learn more about that program. Um, uh, we've got speakers, we've got exhibitors from St. Ben's, St. John's, from uh, the Minnesota DNR, the University of Minnesota, St. Cloud State University, Minnesota Department of Health, Soil and Water Conservation District of Stearns County, the Sock River Watershed, a number of local businesses, local artisans. We have just a great assortment of uh, speakers and exhibitors today, so I really encourage you all to make the most of it and, and network with those folks and, and learn about what you can do to, to further protect this wonderful landscape here in the Avon Hills. Um, lastly, just a couple uh, logistical things. Uh, if you're new to campus or, or the buildings up here, there are pink signs to direct, your, direct you around the quad building. Um, so look for those pink signs on the walls directing you to classrooms, the exhibit hall. Great Hall, et cetera. Uh, there's also a number of volunteers, as I said, and they all have um, name tags that says volunteer in, in red. So feel free to ask them if, if you have questions about anything. Um, and I should mention lunch, because I'm sure you're going to get hungry at some point. You should have received a lunch ticket in your folder. Make sure you keep a hold of that lunch ticket. Uh, lunch will be served right at noon. Um, and so you'll need the lunch ticket. And you can pick up your lunch and then head to the Great Hall where there will be plenty of seating and, and you can enjoy your lunch there. Um, the exhibit hall will be open throughout the day. 
Uh, so during those breaks, during lunch, those are great times. If, if you decide to, to skip a session, you can more than welcome to go through the exhibit hall then as well. So make time to, to check that out. Um, and with that, I'm going to, to turn it over and get our, our presentation started here. So I'd like to bring up uh, the Outdoor U Director and Abby Arboretum Land Manager, John Geisley. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, this, it's great to be back at St. John's. I'm only, I've only been here full time seven months now, so I'm still uh, kind of learning, uh, getting back to the place I was a graduate here, and uh, it's my dream job. So I want to meet everyone here today. Uh, I'm trying to meet all our neighbors and people that are connected with this place. So uh, if you see me around in the exhibit hall, uh, please introduce yourself. I'd like to get to know everyone here. So. Um, Today it's my great honor to uh, introduce Larry Weber. Uh, he's a living legend in my mind. Uh, he's taught, he taught middle school science for 40 years. Uh, and ever since January 1st, 1975, he's kept a daily nature journal. So I'll let you do the math on every day. He has not missed a, a beat. And I think that's done several things for Larry. It's built an incredible knowledge of what's going on around him. Um, and it forces him to live in the here and now. So he's present every day. He's always looking for something to write about, um, which is a pretty phenomenal thing, and you're going to get a treat to hear him today. Uh, he, he's written, another gift that he has is he's, not only does he have all this information in his mind, but he can transfer it to everyone and make it exciting. I've seen him dive on the ground for morel mushrooms. Uh, I've seen him uh, dive for spider webs. And uh, usually you just hear him saying yes in the middle of the woods and you know something exciting is happening. Um, so he has a, he's written a bunch of books just this morning. He does radio programs. Uh, he's really an accomplished naturalist and we're lucky to have him here. So let's give him a warm welcome. Uh, thanks, John, and welcome to everybody. Um, I'm very honored to be here, but I'm also very honored to have worked with John. I taught with John Master Naturalist 16 sessions. I think we set the record for the state for the most Master Naturalist sessions, and to work with him and that fabulous laugh he has, <laughs> and his enthusiasm and his generosity, I taught for 50 years, and there are very few that I taught with that can reach up to John. You're very lucky to have him here. So, as I said, I'm very honored to have taught here. Uh, I have spent uh, 30 of my teaching years in uh, Duluth, and I was fortunate enough to teach seventh grade. Seventh graders are the greatest people in the world, I'm convinced of that. And I was fortunate enough to write my own curriculum. And I wrote my own curriculum, and I built it around phenology, which is the word that we see up there, the phenology. And uh, that's what turned my life around. It caused me to take a closer look constantly at what's going on in nature. Uh, the term phenology has become more common, but it's still, it's still not known to everybody. So I find I always have to define it. So if you, I'm not expecting anybody to start feeling around if you have bumps on the top of your head. That's phrenology, not phenology. And there's been a bunch of other interpretations of that term. But this is the definition that I go with. It's really not a new term, and I can't understand why it isn't more widespread. It goes way back to the mid-1800s. And there were many phenologists, and I think we all practice phenology a lot more than we think. We aren't always doing it when we go through our changes for the seasons. What we do in uh, phenology is we just watch it closer. Now, I'm going to take us a little trip through nature. I am a landowner in Carleton County, southwest of Duluth. I live on 100 acres. Uh, this is wooded glacial hills lakes, ponds, swamps, we've got it all on our property. And I get out and I walk it every day. I have lived there now over 32 years, and I don't think I've ever missed the day on which I was present and that I did not walk it. 
And yes, there's a new story out there every day. There is a mentality that nature is always somewhere else or some other time. Or we have to go up to the cabin or live off the grid if we're going to see nature. But I believe nature is here and now. And I believe that if we take a look through the year, what I'm going to show you, and I'm going to show you lots of pictures of critters, is no different than we can find in almost any setting if we start taking a closer look. I wrote a book about living on our property. I call our property Webwood. And I wrote a book about it. And in the introduction of that book, I mentioned that if you were to drive down the road in front of our house and drive past our place, it would not look special. It looks like just another place along the road. And to many, that's all it is. But when you get out and take a closer look, there's a tremendous amount happening that's there. Many phenologists begin this year with March. It's very common in the world of phenology. They begin it with the vernal equinox. I differ from that. I believe in starting the year on January. Why? It's because of this thing right here, perihelion. We celebrated perihelion a little over a month ago. For those who are wondering what perihelion is, it's the time in which our planet is closest to the sun when we make our trip around the sun. Yes, we are closest in early January. It doesn't translate into a warmer temperatures. And I think that is a pretty good time to start the year. It's just a coincidence that it's almost the same time as the calendar year. When I taught my seventh graders, we went through the year, we looked at the names of the months, and then we also looked at other names for the months. Many of the names of the months we have have gotten lost and don't really mean a lot to us. But if we come up with our own names, we take a closer look at what is going on during that month. Phenology can be based on anything, but most phenologists base it around two concepts of time, one of them being the month, the other one being the days. And the months are probably the easiest ones for us to grasp. Named after the god Janus, who was the god of, uh, door, of doorways or passageways, and yeah, we do sort of go into a new passageway with a new year. With the weather, we have an average temperature. These stats you're going to see are weather service in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, we have an average temperature of about 10 degrees. This year, the average for January was 11. We had some weird January. We had some very cold weather, and then we had over 40 three times. Conditions at mid-month. One thing to look at that I think is the real basis of phenology is this right here, the amount of daylight, nine hours of daylight. I had a... Uh, as, as John or someone was saying earlier, I had a radio program this morning on WTIP in Grand Marais. I, I do another one on Friday morning at uh, KUMD in Duluth. And in both the cases, I mentioned that we passed a real threshold this week on February 8, where we had 10 hours of daylight. And very rapidly in February, the days get longer. Let's take a look at what goes on. This is the sunrise on perihelion. Perihelion at the time, as I said, is usually quite cold, early January. This year it was January 2. It usually is January 2, 3, or 4 at the time we are closest to the sun. Uh, I walk every morning, and it's nice to have a companion. This is one of the companions. Ravens. They are incredible. I, I think we could get hit by an asteroid, and two days later the ravens are going to be out there again. They, are, they, they just can survive anything. Back at the house, this companion is there every morning. Yeah, our state bird is the loon. Well, our loon is nowhere around on these January mornings, but this critter, the chickadee, always is, the black-capped chickadee. And then there, of course, there are others. We don't get red poles every winter, uh, but we are getting them this winter. I have a flock somewhere around 40 that have been showing up every day. And you know what? You know what, I, I, what I've learned in feeding birds? There's a lot of controversy nowadays about feeding birds. What I've learned about feeding birds is we need them more than they need us. And then, of course, there's the opportunist. I had several visits this winter at the bird feeder from a shrike. The shrike doesn't come by to eat the seeds. No, the shrike comes by to eat the seed eaters. And in this case, it's eating a mouse, and it hangs it up on a 
on a, on a thorn nearby. That's why they become known as the butcher bird. A few years ago, I had a shrike came to the bird feeder and then flew off and it kept on coming back to the bird feeder and I wondered what was going on. So I went out and took a look and it had caught a red pole and he impaled it on the bird feeder. And so it continuously came back. Other things that are active in January, these are the tracks of a canine, this is a fox. Despite the cold weathers, canine, foxes and coyotes, especially in my neighborhood, this is their breeding time. And then we have these kind of tracks in the snow that push their way through the snow. It's the short-tailed shrew. Many times I've been out on walk and seen their tracks, and several times I've seen the critter itself pushing through the snow. They are a slave to their own appetite. They must eat constantly or they'll starve to death, and that is winter and summer, day and night. They are always on the move. Sometimes you get a real surprise. I was walking on the lake in January day several years ago, and I came across these tracks. I stopped, photographed them, checked them with the DNR, and yes, it was a lynx that had wandered through. We're pretty far south for a lynx, but it did wander through. Other things that happen in January, this is the time when the seeds of the cattail start to dry up and they break out from, the, from their source and they start to blow away. So we have many things happening in January. Uh, however, we don't, there's a lot of stuff we'll have to wait to see a little bit later. Then we move into February. February is the driest month of the year. I always told my students if every month were as dry as February, we'd be living in a desert. The early thaw has yet to happen this year, but it does now. Usually a little bit of a memory. Some of us might remember February 2, 1996. That was the record-setting cold temperature of minus 60 up at Tower. Some of you might remember that. What most people don't remember is that on February 7, only five days later, the temperature was in the mid-40s in the Duluth area, above. That is quite a switch, and that happens off in February. In February. We haven't seen it this year yet, but the forecast says we are gonna get some warming. The other one I like is the lengthening days. Lengthening days. The sucker moon is a reference to the, uh, the Chippewa name of the, or Ojibwa name of the, uh, of the different months. Notice they have a reference to moon. The word, the word moon is synonymous with the word month. Essentially, that is what the word month means. And every month we have a full moon. Now, of course, this year it's a little bit weird. We had two full moons in January, none in February, and then two again in March. But usually it's one full moon for every month, and that's why they're called a month. February is also named after a midwinter purification ritual, uh, Groundhog Day, and so, those things. I, I think that's really what it's all about, is midwinter. I don't know what it is about uh, winter. Why do people always want to get through it in a hurry? I think we just should stay and enjoy it. But we always seem, <laughs> we always seem to want to just get through it. You know, uh, well, anyway, there's an irony about February. It's the shortest month of the year, but to many it feels like the longest. Some weather stats. Notice we get, uh, we get a lot, we don't get as much pre precipitation and therefore a lot less snowfall than what we have in January. I always told my students, if you want a day off of school because of a, a snowstorm, don't expect it in February. And in the 30 years that I taught at Marshall School in Duluth, I think we had it twice that it happened a day off in February. It just doesn't happen very often. It's too dry. Notice the daylight getting longer. Look at this, at mid-month, Coming this next week, we will be more than 10 hours, and by the end of the month, we'll be 11 hours, okay? And, of course, we get into more as we get into March. This is tracks of wolves. I live on the periphery of the wolf range, but every year, if I'm going to see wolf tracks, it's late winter. Now, whether they get hungry and want to wander or whether they're starting to set, uh, form new territories, I'm not quite sure, but it seems like it's always late winter. And wolf tracks, of course, can be quite large. A little bit hard to see that footprint there, but it's almost as big as the hand. And that's the critter. Other things start to show up. 
might see this track out on your driveway. That's a raccoon. Raccoons do not hibernate, but they do sleep. They sleep in the coldest weather, and when it starts to get a little bit warm, they'll get out and wander around. There's the critter. And then this one, another one that sleeps in the coldest weather and then gets out and wanders around. I saw the tracks of this down in, Wolf, um, uh, down in Moose Lake about, uh, about two weeks ago when we had a mild spell, and that is the skunk. Pileated woodpecker is just one of the woodpeckers in February. This, this month should be named the woodpecker month. This is the month where the woodpeckers that stay with us all winter. I have four kinds that come to my bird feeder. I have downy, hairy, uh, red-bellied, and pileated. And all four, during the month of February, will start doing their drumming. So if you step outside, and even if it's a cold day, and you hear a sound like brrrr, like that coming from the trees, that's woodpecker drumming. And this is just one example of that. Crows start to become more active. Crows are in the, our area are bo both permanent residents in the winter and migratory. And they tend to become more active in flocks in late February. This is a horned lark. A horned lark is a very early migrant showing up. I have seen them in the fields in the middle of February as do the snow buntings, another very early migrant. Other things to look for, almost always in late February, we'll start to see the furry looking buds of the pussy willow. To many people, this is a harbinger of spring. To many people, it is a remedy for something we call cabin fever. And they go out and collect them and bring them in, okay? But it's not alone. Keep looking. You'll see also quaking, quaking aspen has buds like that. And I've seen both of the two in February very often. I haven't seen them this year yet. And then you get surprises. Remember I showed you that one of the lynx tracks in January? That was a surprise. Well, here's a February surprise. I went out to a swamp. We have a swamp that has a beaver lodge on it. I went out there one day and I found the lodge but I also found that. I went out and took a close look, and it was a, a hole gnawed through the ice. What happened was the beaver that had gone into the lodge didn't prepare with enough food for the winter. And so what did it have to do? It had to gnaw its way through the ice, climb up on the shore, and get some food to survive the rest of the winter. Poor planting. My favorite one that I found like this, I don't have a photo of, is one time I found where the beavers ate their way through the lodge because they were trapped in the lodge without food. It's like us being trapped in our house and eating our way through the walls. We get then into March, the crusty snow month, the month of snowstorms. Once upon a time, the statistics for our area was the greatest amount of snow fell in March. Now the greatest amount of snow is pretty much in January, but we still get storms. But it's the month of the vernal equinox when we, first, when we get into spring, crust of the snow moon. It's named after the god Mars, the god of war. It's unfortunate that a lot of the names of, we have for our months really don't tell you anything about the month. So when I was teaching, we always would try to come up with our own names, and the Krusty Snow Month was a pretty good one. In the old calendar, March was the first day of the year. That's one reason why February has only 28 days, but I won't get into that. By mid-month, we have, sorry, by the whole statistics of March, we have more snowfall. 13 inches, many years, a lot more than that. Temperatures are rising. By mid-month, look at that, almost 12 hours of daylight. And 12 hours of daylight is equal, equinox, 12 hours of light, 12 hours of darkness. Yeah, we'll get big snowstorms. March snowstorms are terrific. I can remember many of them, and probably so many of you can remember them as well. They are terrific. I wrote a chapter in my Webwood book about one year where I thought it was a snowstorm in March that saved the frogs. And the way it goes is like this. We had a dry winter. 
up until the end of February, then we started getting snow. A dry winter translates into ponds in the spring with little amount of water. Little amount of water means the frogs cannot reproduce very well. The vernal ponds are suffering. Well, we had a giant snowstorm in early March that year, and that saved the frogs. One of the uh, phenomena of early March is what I call tree circles, where you see melt of snow around the trees. What happens is with the longer days, there's snow, there's sunlight hitting the trees. The trees are dark, it absorbs the sunlight, it re-radiates it back out into the snow and melts it in what I call tree circles. And tree circles to me are a sign for this, that it's ready to start, start, start tapping maple trees. With my seventh graders, I would always do that every year in March. Oh, they love the activity at first. They didn't, they didn't like all the work that went with it. We would go out and we'd tap these and we used a high-tech high for our collecting of the sap. Well, the students would get so into it, they would just drink it right straight out of the tree. Um, I've seen this many times. I've seen them get, drink an entire gallon. You know, so they just go right through it. They just loved it. Well, when I told them about all the work you got to go through to turn that into syrup, they lost their enthusiasm. But to me, the project was not over until we did make syrup, so guess who had to do all the work? Other things that start to happen early in the month, it's too early for the lakes to melt, but the streams will start to open up. And yeah, there's a kind of insect that crawls out of the streams at that time, an insect called a stonefly. They live in the water, underwater, as immatures, but then as matures, they crawl up on the side. Speaking of insects, another thing that shows up, this is an anthill. Ants invented solar heating. And here's the way it works. The anthills are out in the open, and the snow melts. They, they, they put, they put uh, pine needles and other sorts of debris out on the surface of the anthill, and when the snow, sunlight hits it, it absorbs the sunlight and causes the snow to melt on it and therefore warming up the insides. Uh, Jay Cook State Park, which is, a, is, is not far from my house, has a uh, road that goes through west to east, hi Highway 210. I don't recommend anybody doing this, but one time I drove it and just counted the anthills on one side of the road, the side facing south. And I think there was something like 30. On the other side, none. They want to take advantage of the sunlight. Another insect that shows up in March is the morning cloak butterfly. Unlike many butterflies, they hibernate as adults. They crawl into a crack somewhere and they allow a big part of their body to freeze and then they thaw out the neck when the weather starts to warm. Oh, they're called morning cloak and morning is spelled M-O-U-R-N-G-I-N-G uh, because somebody thought with a dark color like that they must be in mourning. Chipmunks start to wake up. I have seen chipmunks awake earlier. I have four times seen chipmunks out active on the snow in January, but th the real activity starts in March. The birds that have been present all winter, the things like the red poles, become more restless, and they start making wheezy noises, and pretty soon they just don't sit still anymore. They move from one place to another. They usually last at the bird feeder until about April, but then they're gone after that. A new one will show up. This is an early migrant. This is a purple finch. Some years, purple finches will be here all winter. This year, I have not seen a single one. And then the red-winged blackbird. I have a swamp near my house. I walk by in my morning walks, and I'm always, after the 20th of March every year, I'm always waiting to hear that sound, that fabulous sound of spring, that orally sound of spring. And this is the red-winged blackbird. Ma uh, males show up like a month before females. And so what they're doing when they sing that early is they're telling the other males that this place is taken. And any time that bird shows up, I know another bird is going to be showing up too. In late March, I have a favorite field I go to. Once again, almost never fails. Somewhere around the 25th of March, I walk out in this field at dusk. And I wait, and I stop, and I listen, 
and now here. Me, me, me. How many have heard that sound? Isn't that a fabulous sound? <laughs> okay. And if you're lucky enough, you can hear the flight that follows it of the woodcock. Yeah, that's out there in, at that time. Late March, I have two birds I always look for, red-winged blackbirds and woodcock. But there's more. There's the migrant of the early hawks, red-tailed hawk, northern harrier, and the migrant of the water birds. Yeah, if there's open water around, those Canada geese are going to find it. Let's go to April. April is the thawing month, but look, it's also the month of grass fires. Spring showers start. And of course, the sugar moon, the, uh, the sap starts running March, but we always had our best collecting in April. It's named after to open. It essentially means, uh, it, it, it has a connection with the word aphrodisiac or to love. And you know, you could say, oh, it's a fairly good name for a month. The weather stats, notice, notice this one right here, we get more rain, but also notice this, seven inches of snow doesn't look like very much. Who can remember April of 2013? Well, I'll refresh your memory a little bit. In Duluth, we got 51 inches of snow in that one month, not quite seven. Who can remember April of 2010? Zero. Look at the difference, 51 to zero. That almost sounds like a Viking game, but 51 to zero, okay. Notice also the days getting longer, okay? Also notice the temperatures and so forth at mid-month. Mid yeah, we'll still get a lot of snow, but this is what I love about April snows. They turn into vernal ponds. Vernal ponds are finally getting the recognition they deserve long ago. I just love vernal ponds. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't think they're worthwhile and they get plowed under and whatever, dumped in holding trash and all sorts of stuff, but they are very valuable. Look who lives there, the wood frog. Walk out on an April day and you're cluck, 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 cluck. that's the wood frog. I was biking on the Munger Trail near my house one April and I heard the frog at a pond. I stopped to take a look. Sure enough, the wood frogs were out on one end of the pond. There was ice on the other end. Chorus frog, they have their little creaking sound that's out there as well. And the peeper, the spring peeper. Yeah, these are all the trio, the early spring trio all go to the vernal ponds to reproduce. No vernal ponds, no reproduction of those frogs. They've got to have that. Other critters that show up in April are more of the water birds like the mallard, great blue heron, killdeer, and out in the field we see the juncos. I have a most interesting situation right now. Juncos are usually migrants. They pass through in the fall going south. We see them again going north in April, many times big flocks in April. Well, I have a situation this year where I have one junco has decided to winter at our house, and it has wintered under our deck and under our spruce trees. And I saw it again yesterday. I think it's gonna make it through the whole winter. Juncos are a type of sparrow. Here's a little uh, trivia thing you can pose to other people. In the world of uh, science, we very often name animals by, and plants, but we usually think of animals, by their scientific name. And with some critters, that's virtually all that's used is a scientific name. When it comes to birds, we use common names. Well, here's one example where the scientific name has become the common name. So when you say junco, you're actually saying it's scientific name. The robins come back and start to sing, as do the thrushes. This is a hermit thrush. Yellow belly sapsucker, Phoebe, and the yellow rump warbler. Wow, this is a great bird. First warbler to arrive every spring. I have never had an exception. Often the first week of April, the last warbler to leave in the fall. They don't go as far south. We have in our area 26 species of warblers, some, about half of which nest there. The rest of them keep going further north. Well, of those 26 species, all but about three uh, spend the winter in Central America and further south. This is one of the ones that doesn't leave our country, and therefore it comes back early. 
The wood starts to take on this kind of a color because of a green on the forest floor. That green is this plant. Notice, surrounded by snow. Wild leek, also called ramp, wild onion, and the first wildflowers of the spring. J. Cook State Park near my house is a fabulous place for wildflowers, but you know what? I don't even need to leave my own property. This is hepatica, which grows there every year. I have never had an exception. Always the first one to bloom. Why? Because it is prepared. It keeps its leaves all winter, so it's ready to go as soon as it gets warm. Bloodroot, another early spring one. Marsh marigold, known by a few other names such as cowslip, but I prefer to call it marsh marigold in the wet places. We also have the migration of other birds starting to show up. This has been a change over the years. Many years ago when I was living in that area, we, we never saw pelicans. Now we see pelicans on a regular basis as a migrant and usually pretty good sized flocks that will stay for quite a while. And the loon. By the time you get to the end of April, two things you can be sure are going to happen. One, the lakes are thawing, and two, the loons are present. Other things a migrant that show up, yep, this is the first migrating, migrating insect to show up. That's the green darner dragonfly. They are migrating. They don't go as far south as the monarch butterfly, but they do migrate. I see them usually around the 20th of April. Also seen around the 20th of April is the queen bumblebee. She survives the winter in a sheltered site, comes out in the early April, early spring days, flies around to find a place to start her nest. Next time you're out on an April day and the snow is melting and you see a bumblebee, just stop and watch it. It flies real low, looking for a place to make its nest. And the first butterfly to show up in the season that is, that is not a hibernator is this little tiny butterfly called the spring azure. It could fit on your fingernail. That's how tiny it is. But they show up about the end of April or about the first day of May. As we get into the wonderful month of May, we are in the greening month. The month of spring wildflowers and the beginning of our rainy season. A lot of people don't realize that we live in a part of the world that has a rainy season as well as other parts of the world that have rainy season. It's named after Maya, the goddess of fertility or mother. And it turns out to be a pretty good name because of our reference, our reference to Mother's Day. Okay. However, there is a other school of thought that says it's actually named after major, as in military majors. The weather stats, notice the precipitation now, but less snowfall. And at mid-month, notice 15 hours of daylight. This is the time of spring wildflowers. Oh, you go out for a walk in May. Do not be in a hurry. Take your time to look at the spring beauties or the Dutchman breeches or the trout lilies the trilliums, trillions of trilliums. Fit this in your schedule sometime this year in May. Visit Banning State Park. Who's been there in mid-May a trillium time? Would you agree with me? It is an incredible place. Jack in the pulpit. Later in May, we'll see things like this. These are the shade-tolerant flowers. The ones that show up in early May have to take advantage of the sunlight. And then we have those that are more shade-tolerant, like this star flower. And the baneberry. These all bloom more in the shaded trees. By the time we get to late May, the leaves have come out on the trees and they're more in the shade. And columbine. Trees are also getting in the act of having some flowers. To the left you see wild plum, and to the right you see juneberry. To the left you see pin cherry, to the right you see choke cherry. And of course apple blossoms and lilac. Warbler time. This is the time to get out and take a warbler walk. 
know, when I go out on walks in May, I do, it's hard to know. Yeah, I want to look at the ground and see everything coming up on the ground, but I want to look in the trees, too, and see all the warblers that are coming through. This is a golden wing warbler. I feel so privileged that there's a golden wing warbler's nest on our property. This is a bird that's endangered in must, much of the country, but they nest at my place, as does this bird, the oven bird. And this one, this is a very... I don't know what it is about veeries, but I find more of their nests than any other bird. Uh, maybe they just don't know how to hide their nest. Baltimore Orioles are come back in May and sing loud, as does the rosebreast grosbeak. I have two pictures here to show the difference between the male and the female. <clears throat> hummingbirds. It takes a little bit of searching, but I find hummingbird nests about every other year in my yard. Red-eyed vireo. What a fabulous bird. Once again, I feel so privileged. I have many pairs of red-eyed vireos nesting here every year. They show up in May, late May. The monarch butterflies first arrive back from the migration in late May, sometimes not till June. And when you get out to collect mushrooms, it's the morel. It's the morel on the right there that we often look for in May. Don't confuse it with the other one, the false morel. I might mention they don't normally grow side by side. This is a setup picture. I was trying to show, I'm trying to show the difference between the two. I had a, if I could tell a quick story here, I had a neighbor that called me up one day and she said, I was out walking in the woods and I found the most wonderful growth of mushrooms, so I decided to bring them home and feed it to my husband. And I, <laughs> and my husband said, I'm not gonna eat those until I know what they are. So she said, okay, I'll call up Larry. So she called me up. I said, well, I'd like to see them. Can you bring them over? And she stepped out of the car with a tray full of the most delicious-looking mushrooms. They were all false morel. <laughs> now, whether she still fed it to her husband, I don't know. <laughs> How about these out on the forest floor? Fiddleheads in May. Yes, but watch out. Something else can still happen in May. We can still get snow. Spider webs. You're going to hear about spiders, greatest critters that ever lived. Spider webs start showing up like this in May, and sometimes you get extremely lucky and you see this. I consider that the greatest photo ever taken in the history of the world. <laughs> Why? Because to see a picture like this for a web watcher like me, it's the only time I have ever seen that much snow on a spider web. It's getting, you're getting a mixture of two seasons here. It was a very weird situation. What happened was it was 2010. We had uh, early spring, no snow in March, no snow in April. It was early, it was warm. The spiders started making webs, and then we got a snow in May, and it covered this web. Let's move on to June. June is the wet month, month of long days, growing month. Summer solstice. It's named after Juno, the god of, okay, once again, or the second school of thought is that it was named after the juniors. May named after majors, June named after juniors. Average temperature of about 60 degrees. Look at that precipitation. And, of course, the long hours of daylight. Almost 16 hours of daylight. Late migrants start to show up. That's the house, house wren. Cedar waxwings are always a late migrant, as are the wood peewee and the cuckoo. Gray tree frogs, and they're not always gray, do their calling in late May into June. And often on June evenings, they'll just, they, they, they call from the swamps and the ponds and so forth, and yet they live most of their lives in the trees. They are an example of a critter that goes from living on land to going to the water to lay its eggs. Meanwhile, in June, here's a critter that lives in water but goes up to land to lay its eggs. That's the turtle. This is the time when turtles come up and lay their eggs. It's also the time of insects, the emergence of the dragonflies. Another example there. Take a walk down to a lake sometime in early June and just look at the dragonflies. They are coming up out of the water, turning into adults. They let their wings spread out and then they take off in flight. Many kinds of them. The 12 spot skimmer. <clears throat> and of course, you've got to take a walk after dark to 
fireflies. One of the things I'd always do, one of the things I'd always do with my seventh graders is that I, I would always ask them to make a list of 10 animals you don't like. Now, we probably would understand what a lot of those animals would be, but one animal that never got on the list was a firefly. This is an insect that people like. And yes, it does light up. The typical scenario is that the male will fly over the grasses, giving off a light at a certain pattern. The female, meanwhile, sits down below the grass, and if she likes his pattern, she will turn on her light, and he will come down to mate with her. So it's been said that he flies and flashes, she sits and selects. Butterfly time. This is the tiger swallowtail, the biggest butterfly we have. And this is one of the smallest. This is a skipper, called the Hobomok skipper. Named after an Indian Hobomok, it's also called the golden, golden skipper. And the luna moth. Wow, what a critter. Silent, not flying around in the day much. Usually we have to just kind of happen upon them. I call the end of spring. I define the end of spring as being the time when the flowers are more abundant in the field than they are in the woods. And this is an example. This is lupin. Daisy. I might mention neither lupin nor this daisy are native to our area. They may be native to North America, but they're not native to our area. And they have moved in, but people still seem to like them. Next time you're walking through a patch of daisies out in a field, stop and take a closer look because you could see more going on. Very common in the daisies is this spider right here, the crab spider. That is the female. That is the male. Other places to see the flowers in June are out in the wetlands. This is the water lilies of two different kinds. This is the irises. And don't forget the orchids. This is orchid time. Late May, stretching all the way to July, is the time of the lady slipper orchids. It might be the moccasin flower here, it might be the yellow lady slipper, or it might be our state flower, the showy lady slipper. But this is their time. I think I figured out why it's our state flower, even though I think many people in the state have probably never seen it in the wild. But it's our state flower because it grows in swampy places where there's plenty of mosquitoes. And I think that's why. I think that's why it was chosen. Let's go to July, the hot month, the month of thunderstorm, ripe berries, aphelion. Early July, about the 4th of July, is the time in which we are farthest away from the sun in our annual trip, aphelion. Named after Julius Caesar, but once again, that doesn't really tell you much about what goes on in July. Look at the average temperature and the precipitation and the amount of daylight. Almost as much as June, but slightly less. Any idea what this picture is? That's right. This is an oak tree that was split by lightning. I was laying in bed early one morning, about 6.30 in the morning, and there was a loud boom. Now, when lightning strikes nearby, we probably have all heard it, but we don't usually see what it strikes. Well, walking a few days later in my woods, I came upon this tree that was split all the way down, an oak tree. The force of that lightning bolt was so strong that it drove these pieces of wood right here, about a foot and a half into the ground. In the woods, it's more shady, but July is the month to get to know the ferns of the woods. There are some plant flowering plants that tolerate the shade, though many of them do not. This is pyrola. This is twin flower. Interesting, interesting plant. It is said that uh, of all the flowers that Linnaeus, this Swedish Linnaeus who named a lot of our plants, of all the flowers he named, he, this is his favorite. So if you look at the Latin name of it, you see it's named after Linnaeus. Indian pipe shows up about this time. A flowering plant, but notice, no chlorophyll. It lives other ways. 
Out in the open, though, this moth belongs to milkweed and fireweed. And fireweed gets its name because it grows back after a fire. Very common in July. As is Joe Pieweed. What a wonderful plant. Supposedly named after an Ar a Narragansett Indian who was uh, a great herbalist back in the days of the colonies. And uh, this plant grows in the swamps, blooming in July. In the bogs, you might find pitcher plant, named after its leaves that are open like such, hollow in the inside. There's the flower sticking up. I was told my seventh graders, we call it pitcher plant, but it's really a catcher, not a pitcher. It catches insects in those hollows there and then proceeds to eat them, digest them. Now we are into the beginning of fungus time, coral fungus. Bright red hygrosabe, also called waxy cap mushroom. A type of uh, chantherelle. This is a type of bolete mushroom. And of course, the sulfur shell, also known as chicken of the woods. Berry thyme. This is service berry, also known as juneberry, raspberry, thimbleberry, blueberry. It's a time of insect noises. Cicadas are calling. Katydids are starting to call. And of course, we still have plenty of butterflies. This is the fritillary. I think the fritillary should be the state butterfly of Minnesota. It is not. The state uh, insect of Minnesota is the monarch. But I think it should be the fritillary because these are so widespread all over the state. And the white admirals show up at this time. And of course, spiders. This is a wolf spider carrying her eggs. That white thing is the egg sac attached to her rear end. When the eggs hatch, the babies climb out and climb on her. Spiders will, at, in July, they, this, this kind of spider, known as a nursery web spider, they'll make a big web where they have their babies and then they'll sit down here and guard it. And I frequently find them in milkweeds and raspberries. This particular one was on a goldenrod. And of course, more spider webs. Greatest animals that ever lived. They are so fabulous. Late season frogs. Not all frogs call in the spring. Here's a green frog. Here's a closer look. It's called green frog because there's color of its head. And the other one that calls in the summertime, the mink frog. And of course, the little frogs are starting to emerge. Back last spring, there was a lot of breeding of frogs. Well, here's a little one, a toad, that comes out in July. Something weird happens when we get to the end of July with birds. You have birds like this bird right here, the yellow throat, which continues to sing and finish its nesting. And then you have the goldfinch, which just starts its nesting in late July. They wait till late July because they want the seeds from thistle to put on their nest. And then you have a bird that's getting ready for migration. This is a tree swallow, and yes, you'll see scenes like this in late July where they line along the wires, getting ready for a migrating flight. So we have some nesting, some finishing nesting, some starting nesting, and some migrating all at the same time. As we get into awesome August, oh, I just love August. We have been teaching Master Naturalist classes in August for the last number of years. It's just a fabulous month to do so. It is the month of, of uh, singing insects and what we call the dog days. Named after Augustus Caesar. Caesar it used to be the, the sixth month of the year. Notice the precipitation. Notice the amount of daylight is getting less. We still have plenty of insects. This is a, uh, a calico uh, pennant dragonfly. Another closer look at it. And another type of butterflies that show up. These are the wood, wood nymphs. They show up late in the season. Monarch butterflies are beginning their migration, yes, in August. And then this insect will show up, some years abundant. That's the white line uh, sphinx moth, and they will show up. I have uh, flocks in front of my house, and, and, and some years just, they're just filled with this critter. The katydids continue their calling. This katydid right here has a point on its head. Its Latin name is conocephalus. Conocephalus means conehead, and that's exactly what it is. Crickets are calling, cicadas are calling, and other insects are very active. This is a, a fabulous critter called a white-faced hornet. To me, uh, summer is not a summer if I don't have one of these in my backyard. 
Oh, I just love these critters. You'll see, you'll see the hornets are on the nest, and you'll also see the opening on the bottom. They go in and out of there. They are predators. They're not after us. They go out and they catch food, other insects, and bring it home to their prey. Sorry, bring it home to their prey. Bring it over to their babies. The babies are inside these little chambers, and the workers feed them. You see how dedicated of a worker they are. They not only feed the babies, they chew it up first to give it to them. There you see it looked at them. Now, late in the season when the blackberries are ripe, they'll, still go, they'll start going out and feeding themselves. The colony is starting to fall apart when you get into August. And so they start saying, well, I'm tired of working all the time. I'm going to start feeding myself. And I'm an avid berry picker, so I often come in contact with them. But notice, white face hornet. This is the hornet. Now look carefully at this next insect. That is a mimic. That is not a hornet. That is a fly that looks like a hornet. How many of us would be fooled by that? Look at that. Isn't that a good imi imitation? Blackberries are ripe in August. Choke cherries are ripe. And yes, this is the hazel. This is the beaked hazel. This is the American hazel. Mushrooms, again. August and September are the great mushroom months. This is Rusla. This is Ammonida. Uh, I might mention uh, mushrooms are often called by their Latin names. When I was uh, teaching students about mushrooms, they absolutely loved it. I never had a class that didn't just love learning about mushrooms. Well, I had what I called three magic mushrooms. This is one of them. This mushroom right here is magic. Why? You pick it up and you break open the cap right there, exposing the flesh. And within seconds, it turns blue. Here's another magic mushroom. Anybody here, please raise your hand if you're willing to tell me if you've ever eaten this mushroom. You might be the only one. Interesting. Okay. Would you recommend it? Okay. All right. Now, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why I asked that question. I had to be convinced to try eating this mushroom. What you're looking at is called a lobster mushroom, Latin name Hypomyces. What you're looking at is not one fungus, it's two fungi. The mushroom has an orange mold growing on it. Before the orange mold grows on it, that mushroom is not edible. After the mold grows on it, yes, it's edible. Magic mushroom. Apparently, the mold's able to detoxify the mushroom. I had to be convinced it was edible. I was giving a class in a university for seniors in Duluth, and I had a student in class who was very into catch, eating mushrooms, and she talked about how great this was. And I said, all right, you bring it to class next week, and we're going to eat it, but I'm going to make sure you take the first bite. <laughs> and you know what? I followed it up and took the second bite, and it was. It was quite good, but I had to be convinced. This is the time of the late season wildflowers, sunflower, aster, goldenrods. I'm giving a program this afternoon on what lives in goldenrods, and this is what got my attention. Look at that. It's just filled with insects. Goldenrods are native plants, and they're just filled with insects. And we have some drama taking place. This is a small brown crab spider. It succeeded in catching a white-faced hornet. Notice where it's biting it. It's biting it by the head instead of the tail. And then it's proceeding to eat it. I came by next day. It was still eating it. But it had now switched to the other end. For those of us who are old enough, it reminded me of a commercial. This, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. It reminded me of that, how that, uh, that crab spider could eat that whole hornet. Get out on the morning. There's no better place to be any. <laughs> Don't have any excuses. There's no better place to be on a morning in late August on a, when it's clear. Oh, it doesn't have to be clear. It could be cloudy or foggy. But to get out in a field and see the spider webs covered with dew, they are abundant. That is such a good sign. And this is a closer look. Yeah, that's the spider sitting right there. 
How these critters got a bad name, I don't know. They are just the greatest. Another example of it. And another. Sometimes the critters come to us. In late August, I often see tree frogs climbing up on the side of the house. The light in the house attracts insects, and the frogs climb up on it to feed on them. Bats are there doing their breeding in August, so they become a little bit more easy to see. And early migrants such as this, uh, this sandpiper, nighthawk, and warblers happen in August. August is so awesome, and it ends with a little note of what we're going to see in September. The cooling month, red leaves, hawk migration, first frost, autumnal equinox. Wow, what a month. August is awesome. September is sensational. Named for the seventh month. You know, this is the first month of the school year, and for many of us in education, it was we, we called it the, uh, the, the, beginning, the beginning of the year. And uh, I always ask my students, you know, what does the word September, the word itself, mean? Well, most people don't know. It, it means this is the seventh month. But it's not the seventh month. It was the seventh month. But even if it were the seventh month, that name doesn't tell you what happens in, uh, in September. So we would come up with our own names, and the cooling month is a pretty good name. Notice the temperature still mild. Also, the precipitation might be kind of a surprise. Daylight starts to dwindle. Migration of flickers early in the month. Woodpecker, that's migratory. Oh, I might mention a woodpecker, that's often a ground pecker. You'll often see these on the ground. This is Hawk Ridge. If you haven't been to Hawk Ridge in September, a little plug for Duluth. If you haven't been to Hawk Ridge in mid-September, put that on your bucket list. This is a sharp shin hawk. I would take my students there every year, and besides seeing the hawks, they'd often have a chance to handle some of the ones that were caught. Here's a broad wing hawk. These are the ones that fly over in really large numbers. And then there's plenty of color. This is Virginia creeper. There you see a closer look at it. This is a cherry, pin cherry. And pin cherries are interesting. Any color you want to see on a pin cherry. All these leaves came from the same tree. You see quite a variety. Uh, red oak is, lives up to its name when you see the red in the leaves. And high bush cranberry. High bush cranberry red with berries and leaves. This is crab apple. They get ripe at that time. And we have some late wildflowers still out there. Zigzag goldenrod. Isn't that a beautiful name? The only goldenrod that grows in the woods. Sneezeweed, another neat name. And this is the emergence of snapping turtles. What a neat thing to see in September. All right, the story goes like this. Snappers come up on land in June. They lay their eggs, dig a hole, lay their eggs, cover it up, then they go away. 90 to 100 days later, out in that sunlight all summer, the eggs develop. The babies crawl out. These all came out from a single nest. I think we counted them. Uh, John was with me at a master naturalist class when this happened. I think we counted uh, 80, 85, something like that. It came out of a single nest. Snapping turtles. Painted turtles don't do that. Painted turtles don't come out till the following spring. The monarchs continue their migration, and they're pretty well done by the end of September. So does this one migrate. This is the Red Admiral. It doesn't migrate as far. In some years, maybe it doesn't migrate at all. It might hibernate. And yeah, the green darner dragonfly is out there again migrating. There are times at Hawk Ridge there are more dragonflies flying over than there are hawks. Here's one that doesn't migrate, but it continues to hang around in the autumn. This is called the autumn, uh, the autumn uh, metal hawk. And many times they will just sit out all night out in the fields, you come out the next morning and your whole body is covered with dew. Other insects of note we tend to overlook, get out to a lake in September and just look at the action of the whirlyjig beetles. They are abundant at this time. They've reached their maturity. They're, they, move, they move around in the gyrating uh, pattern. That's why they're called whirlyjig. And they migrate. They migrate of sorts. They go back and forth across the lake, usually at night. 
And then there's a giant water bug. Late September, I can go to this one swamp and watch as they emerge and take flight. What appears to be going on is that they can feel the water getting colder and they want to go to some place to spend the winter in a bigger body of water. So they leave the ponds and swamps and fly to lakes. It's also interesting to note how the bats overhead try to catch them in midair, but the bat and the giant water bug are almost the same size. Grasshopper time. Whether it's a grasshopper or whether it's its bigger cousin called the locust. They're out there in September. Another interesting, fascinating thing of September is the emergence of the winged ants. This is an ant with wings. They come out from underground at that time and disperse and mate in the air. Spider webs again. Wow, great time to see them, September. September, early September morning, get out and walk in the, I don't, go get wet in the dew, it's worth it. It's great. The webs are abundant. There's so many of them. These are what's called the orb webs. There's the kind of spider that makes them. It's called the shamrock spider. Dew drops hanging on the web are what a lot of people try to get out and photograph. Believe it or not, there are people out there who don't like spiders. But I have found that even some of these people who don't like spiders still like to, to photograph spider webs. And this is often what they look for is the dew. Well, here's a little challenge. How about photographing the frost on the web? That's a tougher one, but I've seen that in September. This is a field covered with another kind of web. Those are called funnel webs. They're low down by the ground, but there are many of them. And yes, they'll often have frost on the cool mornings. Mushroom circle, known as a fairy ring. Out, this is the time to see them. This, is, this has gotten a couple of different names. Hedgehog is one name for it. I just call it by its Latin name, Horatium. Puffballs are out at this time. They're starting to show up. And then there's magic mushroom number three. So some of you might recognize this mushroom called Shaggy Mane, also known as Coprinus. This is what the mushroom looks like. Here's what I would do with my, this with my students. I would bring this mushroom indoors on a Monday I would put it in a container or a plastic bag and leave it there until Friday. By Friday, that's what the mushroom looks like. Now I'm going to do that again. Huh. Appears as though technology has struck in, but that's okay. Uh, the mushroom turns into liquid. It digests itself. And with seventh graders, they thought that was cool. I'm I'm stuck. Help. I can't go any direction. Okay, okay thank you. Yep. I think it's good now. Let's go to October, the leaf drop month. Okay, if when we start getting freezing. Eighth month, that's where oct comes from. Notice we do get some snowfall. This year, the biggest snow we've had until up to today in the Duluth area was late October, October 27th, 10 and a half inches of snow. Notice the daylight is dwindling. Late season flowers, this is the New England aster. This is the Maximilian sunflower, which is maybe more common around here. It is not common in my area, and I'm so glad it, there are places I can find it. Late season, very bloom, very late. Late mushrooms are like this scaly cap, scaly cap, also known as foliota. Armorilia, also known as honey mushroom. Oyster mushroom. We get a sound that we associate with spring happening in October. Yeah, the rough grouse will do their drumming in fall. The males tell the other males, the young ones, hey, this place is taken. Migrants that come through are some of the sparrows. This is a fox sparrow, the junco again, snow bunting again, and flocks of blackbirds. red tailed hawk are migrating. Turkey vultures are migrating. And the saw wet owl. There have been nights in Duluth at the banding station at Hawk Ridge where they've caught over 100 saw wet owls in one night. This owl is so small it could fit in your hand. And they migrate flying real low, going south, and October is the best time for it. Unfortunately, flying south can be dangerous, flying low can be dangerous, and they often get hit by cars. Tundra swans come through in October. 
Here is a butterfly that doesn't migrate. This stays all winter as a hibernator. Okay, my, I called it the Halloween butterfly. My seventh graders said that, okay, it's black and orange, Halloween, but they also thought it looked like the face of a black cat. One eye, the other eye, and the mouth. Aren't seventh graders cool? Okay. Another hibernating butterfly, the comma, named after that little mark right there, the comma. Morning cloak. This is a morning cloak that had a pretty tough season. This is what it looks like now, and it's getting ready to hibernate. And then there are those that don't hibernate. They just continue to breed late in the season. This is one of the uh, sulfur butterflies. Late season moths. I call these World Series moths. They emerge about the time of the World Series. They don't even have a mouth. They just fly around and breed in a temperature of about 30 degrees. Woolly, woolly bear caterpillar, well known, often seen late in the season. Uh, they winter as a caterpillar. They don't even for, form a cocoon. They just curl up and sleep as a caterpillar. Ladybugs also start congregating at that time, getting ready for winter, as do what I call the uh, dancing crane flies. These will go on a flight like this at dusk as we get into October. It's essentially the males trying to uh, get, a, get the position to mate with the females. This is woolly aphid <clears throat> that shows up on uh, alders, often easy to see in October. Many late season webs, such as this sheet webs. Ballooning of spiders, wow, this is the time to see it. Wow, we all know Charlotte's web. We all know that Charlotte dies toward the end. And we all know that she has babies that survive and come out the next spring. And that those babies drift away. This is what's called ballooning. And that's what this spider is doing. I wish I could say this is my photo. This photo was taken by a friend of mine, and she saw it actually in this pose, throwing out its thread to drift off in the wind. And this is what we usually see the next day. We see these threads that tell us they've been traveling. Other critters that are going into hibernation at this time, easiest time of year to see garter snakes or red belly snakes. Chipmunks are getting ready to go back to sleep, as well as the Franklin ground squirrel. Some late season uh, trees still have color, like this maple, red maples. Sugar maple is yellow. Aspen, here's some view you'd see up the North Shore about this time. The uh, hazel can be either yellow or red, and this is what you would see by mid-month. This is the month of leaf drop, and about the middle of the month is when the leaves fall. This is what the woods looks like one day. This is what it looks like a couple days later. This is tamarack. I think anybody who was born around the 20th of October should be named tamarack. That, that is such an amazing time where the trees just turn so bright yellow, gold in color. And yeah, they still have cones, but they'll drop their needles unlike other conifers. And yes, we can get a mixture of snow. Let's go to the November. Some people may have heard of this saying about November. No sun, no grass, no flowers, November. What they're trying to tell us is that they think November is boring. <laughs> but get out and take a look. There's a lot going on. Yes, it's the ninth month. The days continue to get shorter, and things start happening. This is the month of Otwin. Otwin is kind of my made-up name, but it really works. This is the time between the leaf drop and the snow cover. And all sorts of things show up on the forest floor, like this club moss, a couple kinds of club mosses, ferns that are still green. This is the wood fern. And then we see the fungus. This is a shelf fungus, another one called turkey tail. This is a tiny fungus known as eyelash. I think it's just gorgeous. And then there is uh, bird's nest fungus, various kinds of jellies and lichens. This is the time of year to see the lichens on the trees because there's no leaves to hide them. And they may be hanging down very long sometime, or they may be little short ones like this, British soldier lichen. Berries out there are the wintergreen, the uh, rose hips, high bush cranberry. This is winterberry holly. This is what the goldenrod looks like now. And the milkweed, they take wind. They take usually fly in the early November and fireweed. Yeah, there's the snow buntings in migration, but we usually see them as a flock. Pine grosbeaks start showing up 
as do the rough leg hawks. One of the critters that comes to us in November, the white-footed or deer mouse, and they'll come into our houses and they don't look as deer anymore. <laughs> flying squirrels, you know, most people don't even know there's a, how much flying squirrels are around. They think, oh yeah, there might be a few. No, they're very common, they're very common. We just don't usually see them because they're almost 100% nocturnal. I started feeding them a number of years ago and then put a light out on the feeder to see them. This is the deer time, of course, deer season. But it's also time when I go to the beaver lodge. I always go to a beaver ponds in November to see what's going on. This is a typical situation. You have the lodge, you have some freezing up going on. Uh, if there's open water, we'll still see the beaver. The beaver does a lot of uh, gathering of food to cache for winter at this time in November. Sometimes it's joined by a couple of neighbors. This is the best time, one of the best times of the years i found to see otters. And sometimes strange things show up in the ice. I was out at my light lake one November morning and I found this track right here in the ice. There's my sunglasses next to it. That's a pretty good size bird track, isn't it? Well, I think it was done by the trumpeter swan. And then this critter, this is not a, a tracks in snow. No, this is tracks in frost. A raccoon came walking there and left its footprints in the frost. A deer walked out on the ice early in the season and got confused and went through what I call a deer dance. And then looking through the ice, I was surprised to find swimming turtles, both the painted turtle and the snapping turtle. And of course, by the late end of the month, we get some snow, and then we get into the wonderful month of December, the dark month. You know, we have a, we have a mentality that light is better than dark, warmth is better than cold, and yet December, which is both dark and cold, is often one of our most favorite months. Notice the amount of snowfall and the amount of daylight, shortest days of the year. But many critters are out. This is the tracks of the snowshoe hare that has turned white and still out there. This year, in early December, these critters went through a pretty difficult time. We had very little snow. We had snow in October, and we lost a lot of it in November. By early December, we had very little. These critters had about a week or two that it was pretty tough until the snows came back. Here's another hopper out in the snow. This is that same white-footed or deer mouse we saw earlier. The only hopper that leaves a tail mark in the snow. It has a cousin that goes under the snow, spends winter under the snow, and that's this critter right here, the field mouse or the vole. But anytime you have somebody like that that goes under the snow, you're gonna have somebody come along to try to eat it. And that is, this, these are tracks of a weasel. And if you ever want a good workout, find weasel tracks and follow them sometime. Boy, they just go everywhere. Here's the ly lichens hanging down still in the winter, as is a kind of green fern. This is a uh, rock cap fern, stays green all winter, our only evergreen fern. And of course, we have some uh, mountain ash berries still there, as well as some high bush cranberries still there, and chaga. Uh, I usually don't tell people, if I find chaga, I usually don't tell people where it is. Uh, there is a, a lot of people out there who go and cut it down right away, uh, they collect it. Uh, as, a, as a form of a, uh, a medication, a medicine. And so I usually don't want to, people cutting down the trees. It's real hard to get off. You have to use a saw or an ax. It's a kind of, it's a, incidentally, that, that black thing, in case you're wondering what it is, it, it is a kind of shelf fungus. At the bird feeder, the nuthatches will show up as the red belly woodpecker. Red belly woodpecker is an interesting one. I see them every day now at my bird feeder, but maybe 20 years ago, it was a very rare sighting. They've moved up from the south. Crossbills will move in in some years. This year, we had a really good movement in December of red crossbills, and they're called that because, yes, they do have their beaks cross. And then some years, we'll see a sign like this out in the snow. This is a rather weird-looking track. What happened was somebody jumped into the snow, and then as it left, it pushed itself off with its wings. Well, who done it? The great gray owl. And great gray owls are pretty good this year. Uh, they're not the, you know, hundreds of them, but they are out there. And they hunt in the daytime. They dive in the snow to catch mice under the snow. 
Coyote breeding season actually begins in late December, and that's what these are. These are coyote tracks at that time. There's the footprint of it. There's the scent marking of it right there. This is about the time of the holidays, and as the holidays get to, we, we always like to see garland in the holidays. Well, that's what this is. This is snow garland, also called snow rope. I don't see it every winter. I don't think I've seen it at all this winter yet. But isn't it cool when it shows up? And finally, nice place to spend the winter. That's my house in the winter. So thank you very much. I didn't talk about the mosquito? Or ticks? You want me to? I'll, I'll be glad to talk about both of them. <laughs> uh, I am often asked about both of those. To me, it's nothing more than another thing to accept with the outdoors. We accept cold weather, we accept storms. Well, you accept the mosquito, you accept. I, years ago, I stopped using repellent. I didn't like the smell of it. So I just, I just put up with it. Uh, there's always a chance things can happen. As far as ticks go, uh, we have different kinds of ticks, and we have to watch it carefully. We can take it seriously. Lyme disease is for real. It's spreading in this country. It's spreading in this state. Uh, it's just another thing to watch out about. Anybody else? Yes? Question. Did I talk about the bullfrog? No, I didn't talk about the bullfrog. I realize where I am here, there is some bullfrogs. Uh, in my part of the state, we don't have them. In this part of the state, even though they're here, they're not native here. Bullfrogs are native to the south and east of here. They were native to maybe uh, way down in the southeast part of Minnesota, but that's it. Wisconsin, however, they're quite common. Uh, bullfrogs are fascinating. I absolutely love the call of the bullfrog. Uh, they're great to watch and so forth, but when they get introduced into an area where they're not native, they tend to bull the rest of them and, and, take, and, and attack and eat other things. Yes, they do. Um, I don't know if that's saying enough about the bullfrogs. They are a summer breeder. Now your question. Uh, it depends on the kind of swan. You're asking about the swans that in winter here? You can go to places in Minnesota almost as far north and I think even further north than where we are right now, and you can find a trumpeter swans that winter here. Uh, let's put it this way. If they can find open water, they'll stay. If that open water is generated by humans, that doesn't mean anything to them. It's still open water, and they'll stay. And that's a trumpeter swan. Tundra swans don't do that. Tundra swans have an interesting net, uh, migration route. They winter up in the tundra. Uh, sorry, they summer up in the tundra. That's why they're called that. They winter on Chesapeake Bay, way over there by Maryland. And they pass through here as they go from here to the, from one to the other. So if you're seeing swans this time of year, or as we probably will in the next month, those are trumpeter swans. Trumpeter swan has an amazing story. Uh, 30 years ago, if anybody saw a trumpeter swan in Minnesota, boy, it would be big news. And it was, uh, I believe, about 2008 or 07 when I saw the first trumpeter swan on my property. Now, speaking of my property, I showed you pictures of lots and lots and lots of critters. Every one of those I have seen on my property or near my property. And like I was saying back in the beginning, nature is here and now, and no, we don't need to go up to the cabin, and we don't need to live off the grid in order to see nature. It's right here and now. And if anybody has any more questions, yes? What are the biggest changes you've seen? You know, that's a wonderful question. The biggest changes that I've seen on my property in 32 years, we moved in in 85. Okay, so it's going to be 30, 33 years in June. Uh, has been with the amphibians. Uh, salamanders were very common when we first got there. 
we were burning firewood and, and we had it stacked outside and every time we turn over firewood, we'd find salamanders. Right now today, it's hard to find any salamanders. Uh, frogs, when we first moved in in the mid 80s, the leopard frogs, which I didn't even talk about, are, were very common. We couldn't even walk in the yard without seeing leopard frogs. They went through a complete dip to almost zero. Now they've come back again. Uh, those are probably the biggest changes. Maybe the deer tick is the other big change. We never even heard about the deer tick when we first moved in. But now it, uh, it is now well known. We have to watch it very carefully. Changes uh, can be the other type as well. I love the fact that the trees are nice and big. I love the fact that we got plenty of trees and they're healthy and they have uh, they have lots of uh, berries and so forth. I like the fact that there are red belly woodpeckers moved up from the south. Wild turkeys have moved up from the south. I like those. So not all changes are necessarily a bad thing. I like a lot of them. Yes. Snow fleas. Snow fleas. I am so glad to hear you ask about snow fleas. Many years ago, for the conservation volunteer, I wrote an article on insects that are out in the snow. Now, the best known of those is the snow flea. A snow flea is called that, even though it's not a flea. It is a springtail. It's a kind of insect that has no wings, very tiny. They look like a dot. Go out on a mild day coming up later this month and early March. Go out and look in the snow. Um, you won't find it everywhere. I find it more in a wet, wooded area. Uh, go out and look at the snow, and it looks like somebody sprinkled pe pepper on the snow. Then watch that pepper, and that pepper will jump around. Those are, called, those are called snow fleas. They live under the snow in the very cold weather, but then they come up to the surface, and they hop around, and they feed and breed on the surface of the snow. They are not the only insect that comes up on the snow in the, in, in the winter, but that's probably the most abundant one. Thank you for asking that. I love snow fleas. Okay, any, any other? Yes? Why do you love spiders? Why do you love spiders? Because spiders are fabulous. Okay. Uh, it's a little hard to, for anybody who's in love with anything to pass on the reasons for it. I guess it's because, and it's not because of my last name. No, I guess it's because I did what I wasn't supposed to do when I was an adolescent. And that was, I took a close look at spiders. And I realized that despite all the stories, I was told those stories too, about how terrible and dangerous and creepy and so forth. They're, despite all that, they weren't that way at all. I have handled spiders for 50 years, and I'm still here to talk about it. Okay. They, they're just fat. If, to get, how many knows the story of Charlotte's Web? Real well. Okay, how many remember the spot where the parents are wondering about their daughter, Fern, because she spends so much time watching the pig, and then the spider web that goes along with it. So what do they do? They, good parents, what do they do? They're worried about their daughter. They consult the local minister. Now, some stories say they go to the doctor, but the local minister. They ask the local minister what's going on. And they talk about the spider, and they said, we must have had a miracle with this message written in the web. Do you know what the minister says back to them? Most people overlook that part of the story. The minister says the web itself is a miracle. I have a book out there for sale, brand new, 2018, entitled Web Watching. In the introduction... I talk about what goes into the making of a web of a spider. It is incredible. They do it an entire web. Most books say a half hour. In watching them, I think it's a little bit longer than that. But they make that whole thing that fast, and it involves at least five different kinds of silk in a single web. Incredible. Now, I'm a person who's so uncoordinated, I'd probably fall off this stage if I wasn't holding on to it. But they show a coordination in making a web that is just amazing. Like I say, spiders are the greatest animals that have ever lived. I was uh, with one of the local TV channels, Channel 6 in Duluth, and he always wanted to do a program about animals. And I said, come with me and take a walk in late summer out, and we're going to look at the webs. And so we did. 
And so we were looking at the webs, and I caught the spiders, and I showed them on. I said, here, I got a better idea. I said, here, you hold the spider. So I gave it to him. He was very, very good about it. He held it fine. I kept going on, blabbering, blabbering, blabbering about spiders. And finally he said, is there anything bad you can say about spiders? And I said, no, there is nothing bad to be said about spiders. They have gotten such a bad rap. Arachnophobia. Some people who study phobias say that arachnophobia is just exists because we don't look past that. They, they're just a fabulous group of animals, <laughs> okay? I might mention I'm in love with a lot more animals and plants and fungi than just spiders. Someone once asked me, is there any critter I didn't like? I thought for a long time and I think, I don't quite appreciate cats. But, but then we got a cat, and now I appreciate cats. <laughs> Any other question? Do you let the spiders live in your house? Oh, of course. Spiders living in a house is a great sign. If I was to come in this room right now, I would, I'm not a betting person, but I would bet I could find live spiders in this room right now. And that is a good sign. It means you haven't sprayed chemicals all over the place. And the spiders are predators, and they're feeding on some other insects that are here. I was, uh, within this past year, I was at a church that prides themselves in welcoming everybody, and I found just the most wonderful group of spider webs. I didn't have the camera with me then, but I came back at another time and I photographed them and somebody asked me what I was doing. Okay. And I said, well, you've got some great spiders here. And you know what? I didn't think they were as welcoming to everyone as much as they thought they were. <laughs> no, spiders got a bad rap. It's too bad. Okay. Any other, any other, any other questions? Thank you so much. You've been fabulous. Yeah. All right, so thanks all. Uh, 11 o'clock is the first session. Um, keep in mind, Larry will have his, his books for sale um, over in the exhibit hall, so check that out, and you'll get to connect with Larry there during different breaks. Um, he's also doing uh, In a Patch of Goldenrod presentation uh, in our third session at 2.30 this afternoon. So uh, the first session starts at 11 o'clock before lunch at noon. Uh, you can make your way back over to the quad and enjoy your day.